Building the Great Pyramid of Khufu The creation of the pyramids, especially the Great Pyramid of Khufu at Giza, still baffles the imagination. How could those large stones be cut, then moved over long distances, and then lifted high up the pyramid? Especially since the heaviest blocks were granite blocks of about 80 tons, lifted about 50 meters up to the roof of the king's chamber in the middle of the pyramid. To better imagine how it is even possible that something as grand as the pyramid of Khufu was created with the technology of the time, it is useful to first look at the development of the pyramid in Egypt. In this lecture I'll show you that first of all, the process of pyramid building was slowly perfected over the centuries. The pharaohs started out in simple mud brick tombs, then built a number of unstable failed pyramids, until they finally ended up with a working plan. And reliefs and paintings from Egypt show how huge granite pillars were shipped by boat. And we also see huge groups of men dragging large statues on sledges. And on top of this evidence, we have since 2013 an account of a minor official who worked on the artificial lake system that allowed boats to close in on the pyramid from the Nile. I've discussed these texts in depth in my previous lecture. And the same official also describes carrying limestone back and forth from the quarry in Tura in quick two or three day intervals. And there is even more. Archaeologists have since also found the workers' town and the associated cemetery that revealed job titles to do with the building of the pyramid. So we have a lot to get to. Let's start. Hey, good to see you. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. On this World History Channel, we'll trace humanity's relentless pursuit of scientific truth, moral excellence and enlightenment. We'll meet anyone from Mesopotamian astronomers and Indian yogis to Greek philosophers and Enlightenment scientists. And you'll meet them firsthand using primary sources, giving you valuable insights that transcend the surface level understanding you get on other channels. Go check it out for yourself. Let's start. Let's start with a short history that led up to the building of the Great Pyramid of Khufu. During the first dynasty of Egypt, pharaohs were buried in simple mud brick tombs. Here for instance we see the tomb of Narmer from around 3100 BC. And this was the pharaoh who first unified Egypt and founded the first dynasty. Unfortunately these early tombs were all robbed long ago, so we know little about what was inside them. And here we see the remains of the tomb of Den from around 2970 BC. This was the first tomb using red and black granite, which was used for the floor. And it was also the first tomb with stairs leading down into it. And remarkably, this king was also buried with 136 men and women who seemed to have been strangled at the same time to accompany the king in the afterlife. Little is known about the second dynasty of Egypt, but the third dynasty became spectacular. The first pharaoh of this dynasty was Djoser from the 27th century BC, and he became the first pyramid builder. It is commonly believed that this first pyramid was designed by Imhotep, the chancellor to the pharaoh and the high priest of the sun god Ra. And in fact, we found a statue base from this pyramid that reads, the chancellor of the king of lower Egypt, administrator of the great palace, hereditary lord, greatest of seers, Imhotep the builder, the sculptor, the maker of stone vases. And this text calls him a builder, but not directly the architect of the pyramid. He might well have been, yet only during Greek times was his name explicitly associated with the architect of the first pyramid. The pyramid of Djoser still stands today and is a so-called step pyramid with an impressive height of 60 meters. It was the first large project in Egypt where limestone was used as a primary building material instead of simpler mud bricks. 
And underneath the pyramid, various shafts and the king's burial chamber were carved out below ground. Stunningly, this burial chamber and the sarcophagus inside were made of granite from the quarries of Aswan, which are located about 900 kilometers to the south. And it has to be mentioned that this pyramid doesn't just stand alone in the desert. It is part of an entire walled courtyard, containing various buildings, some with beautiful stone columns, as you can see here. The pharaoh Sneferu from the 26th century BC became the founder of the 4th dynasty, and he built three pyramids. The first was the Maidum Pyramid, which was so steep that it looks more like a tower than a pyramid. It originally was meant to be a seven-step pyramid, but part of it is now under rubble. But he eventually gave up on the project. The second one was the Bent Pyramid, which likely started off too steep and was then adjusted halfway to a smaller angle. But it still turned out to be unstable, and eventually it was abandoned. Sneferu's final pyramid was the Red Pyramid, which also became his burial place. It is the first true pyramid, and it reached a height of 105 meters. And based on dates graffitied on the building, we know that they were able to raise the pyramid 10 to 12 meters in just two or three years, which is quite an impressive speed. Sneferu's son, Khufu, also from the 26th century BC, was the greatest pyramid builder. He built the Great Pyramid of Giza, which contains, according to estimates, an astonishing two and a half million blocks, averaging two and a half tons each, and the pyramid reaches a height of 147 meters. Inside this pyramid are various passageways. Especially impressive is the Grand Gallery, with its tall, corbelled ceiling. And it leads to the king's chamber, the burial place of Khufu, which is located 43 meters above ground. The room itself is not decorated and only contains Khufu's sarcophagus. And all you see in this room, both the walls and the sarcophagus, are made of granite blocks from Aswan. With the heaviest blocks, which are located in the extended roof of the chamber, weighing up to 80 tons, in the upper chamber in the roof, by the way, the builders of Khufu left a graffiti stating Friends of Khufu. And we also have multiple graffiti of two other building teams who, who compounded their team names with two of the multiple names of Khufu. But now to the many questions. How did they cut these heavy blocks? And how did they move them? And how were all these blocks lifted all the way to the top of the pyramid? Let's start with the cutting of the blocks. The making of these blocks is decently understood. Copper saws, for instance, could be used to cut in stone. Copper itself is too weak for this, but if you add some quartz sand, this sand does the actual cutting, as can be shown with experiments. And this was also confirmed, since in some of the ancient cuts, we have found a mixture of this quartz sand combined with green copper oxide. A beautiful confirmation of this theory. And sometimes much harder basalt and dolerite chisels were also used to cut tough materials such as granite. And I also want to mention a technique to split rock. Some holes were drilled into the rock and then wooden packs were hammered into these holes. Then water was added so that those wooden packs would expand, allowing the rock to split neatly along the line of these packs. But what about moving the blocks? We have direct evidence of how this happened from a wall painting in the tomb of Jehuti Hotep. Here we see a large statue moved on a sledge, pulled by an enormous amount of people. And notice here a figure on the tip of the sledge, who pours down water on the sandy floor which, according to modern experiments, reduces friction by half. Yet most of the distance, the stones weren't pulled by sledges, but instead carried by boats along the Nile. And we also have direct evidence of this 
from a relief from the pyramid complex of Unas at Saqqara. Here we see boats with each two palm-shaped granite columns. And each of these columns is said to be 20 cubits or just over 10 meters. And a simple calculation then gives us that these columns had to have an estimated weight of 38 tons each. And since this boat carries two of them, the boat carries 76 tons in total. And now the mystery of how the stones were lifted upwards to the pyramid. Various pyramids show evidence of ramps, which were created during the construction of the pyramids and then removed after. Obviously, these ramps had to be quite long to reach up the pyramid without too large of an incline. And these ramps, by the way, were already mentioned in Greek times. A man named Diodorus Siculus from the 1st century BC has the following interesting thing to say about them. He writes, And it said the stone was transported a great distance, and that the edifices were raised utilizing earthen ramps, since machines for lifting had not yet been invented in those days. And most surprising is that no trace remains of ramps, so that it seems not to be the result of the patient labor of man, but rather as if the whole complex were set down entirely upon the surrounding sand by some god. So the Greeks too were amazed by this impressive building. It is now generally believed that the Pyramid of Khufu had two ramps at least, one coming from an artificial harbor in order to lift the stones up the pyramid that were brought by boat from afar, such as the high quality limestone from Tura and the granite from Aswan. And there was also a ram coming from a nearby quarry, from which the rougher core stones for the interior of the pyramids were taken. And indeed, Egyptologists claim that remains of these rams have been discovered. They were made of two walls of pieces of broken limestone that were set in clay mortar, also known as tafla, and with the area in between them filled with sand and gypsum. And these are found on several locations. And finally, we look at the evidence of the complicated organization required for such a humongous operation. Since 2013, as discussed in the previous lecture, we have papyri that date to the time of Khufu that record the daily activities of a minor official named Merer and his crew. And he gives a first-hand account of the artificial waterways that connected the pyramid to the Nile. And those waterways, by the way, are now archaeologically confirmed. We also read that his team was part of a 600-man operation to release a dam at what they called the entrance of the Lake of Khufu. And this was done likely to fill up these waterways when the Nile was flooding. And then we read that this team goes back and forth to Tura by boat in two or three day round trips to move that high quality limestone for the outer casing of the pyramid to what the text calls the horizon of Khufu, meaning the pyramid itself. And there we read that those stones were hauled from the boats on shore. Close to the pyramid, archaeologists have also found a huge worker town called Hyde al Gurab, which contains houses, workshops, bakeries, barracks, grain storages and more. At this time, this town can only be dated back to Kafr, the son of Khufu. But it is possible that there is an earlier phase underneath that, is, that actually dates back to the time of Khufu. In the western part of this town, we see some larger houses with thicker walls. And in it we also find evidence that large amounts of prime meat were eaten there. So these were clearly elite houses. And in fact, archaeologists have found seals in these houses on which the high ranks of these people were written. These titles include Scribe of Royal Documents, Overseer of Scribes of the Tutor of the Royal Children, and Overseer of Scribes of all the King's Works. And on the hillside immediately next to this worker's town, we have found the town's cemetery. And here we read titles such as Overseer of the Site of the Pyramid, or director of the draftsman, or overseer of masonry, the director of workers, and the inspector of craftsmen. 
most of them likely directly to do with the building of the pyramids. And so, there we have it. What we know thus far of the remarkable achievement of the building of the Pyramid of Khufu. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to know more about Egypt or any other topic from world history, then read my book In Search of the Sublime. You can read it completely for free on worldhistorybook.com or you can buy a physical copy on Amazon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye bye.